So this is. So this is ses session seven, Neuroscience of Creativity, and our first speaker is Mariah Stoltium, um, third year PhD candidate at Utrecht University in the Netherlands, and her research focuses on the relationship between creativity, executive functions, and mathematical, mathematical problem solving, mathematical creativity, and at the moment she's working on a longitudinal behavioral study on, and an EEG project in which she investigates neurocognitive attentional differences and similarities in children with attentional problems, highly creative children and typically developing children. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you for this introduction, Matthias, and thank you for making everyone enthusiastic about neuroscience and creativity in your keynotes. It's a great place to start my own presentation. Um, so I want to start off with kind of creating a situation uh, in response to this image. So uh, in general, every day, every minute, we receive many different stimuli from our environments and not all of them are relevant, of course. And the ones that we actually process and will use and become conscious uh, depend on the filter that we have. So in this case, as you can see, the filter is quite uh, stringent and not that many stimuli actually reach your consciousness and your working memory. So this child will um, use these relevant stimuli to complete a task or uh, think of a, an idea. However, this can also happen. Everyone is different. Some filters are more broad and um, this picture actually uh, depicts a child with ADHD. So of course their filter is quite broad, they have more leaky attention and uh, relevant as well as irrelevant stimuli uh, will reach consciousness and in this case this child might get overwhelmed and not be able to finish the task. So what we think is that uh, creativity or highly creative people and in my study highly creative children are somewhere in the middle. Um, so. Empirical research and anecdotal evidence has uh, multiple times linked creativity and ADHD. So perhaps uh, this um, more diffuse type of attention is not always bad and might actually be a positive side effect uh, for creativity. And as you, can, um, as you can see by these studies, if you want to read them, uh, many children that are highly creative are actually diagnosed with ADHD. Um, other research also points towards um, this result that creative people actually make more intrusion errors, which um, relates to the fact that they also receive much more irrelevant stimuli uh, into consciousness, into working memory that they then accidentally use. And on top of that, other research supports this result as well, and they say that adults with ADHD actually report more Creative, com uh, creative achievements in comparison to adults that do not have ADHD. And this result was mediated by reduced inhibition, which is basically the same as uh, more leaky attention, more broad attentional filter. Uh, so I will focus on this uh, broader attentional filter, but then in the brain, and this is called sensory gating. So what does this mean for creativity? So if we not only receive super relevant, super common stimuli even from uh, your memory, but also from the environment, um, you might come up with more original or more uh, creative ideas in comparison to uh, someone that is less creative. And this is what we try to figure out in this study. Um, so on a previous conference, uh, which was from the Society for Neuroscience and Creativity, I presented some very preliminary results on this as well um, with the uh, sensory gating measure called pre-pulse inhibition. So <clears throat> in this graph, you can first of all see that when there's a pulse, so a really startling stimulus, uh, children with attentional problems are much more startled in comparison to the other groups. Um, so this is a muscular response. And followed are the creative children that are a little bit startled and then typically developing children are least startled. And in this graph, uh, we have basically the same uh, response. However, there is a pre-pulse, so it's 
um, indicates that there, the startling uh, stimulus will uh, happen very soon, and the sensory gating then should happen uh, as, a, as a response to the pre-pulse. So the gating in attentional children with attentional problems goes worse, so they are still really startled. Um, creative children also have some problems apparently, and uh, typically developing children can really sensory gate this uh, type of stimulus quite well. So based on these results, we're really excited and wanted to look further, of course, and that's what I'll be talking about today. And I'll be using two EEG measures, so electrical signals in the brain. And the first one is mismatch, mismatch negativity. So mismatch negativity um, is uh, a signal in the brain that's a negative when, oh, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Um, when there is a diff different, a deviant, or a novel stimulus. So your brain picks up that uh, something new is happening. So you have a lot of standard, standard stimuli, stimuli, and then sometimes there's a different one, mostly it's a higher or lower tone, and then the brain will show a negative electrical uh, signal. And a less um, pronounced mismatch negativity results, or less negative, means that a person will have uh, a more broad type of attention and will respond to irrelevant stimuli uh, in a different way as to standard stimuli. The other measure we used was P3A. This comes right next, uh, right after mismatch negativity, and uh, this has more to do with uh, the preparation for an attentional shift. So there's not a shift yet, um, but the preparation of kind of diverting your attention to the novel stimulus that might be important. Uh, so this is a positive, um, a positive ERP, and it ha is, has been related to cognitive flexibility and task set shifting, which are, of course, also very important components in creativity. Um, so these two EEG measures have not been uh, tested before in creative people, uh, but have been related to attentional problems and broader attention in, for example, schizophrenia patients. Um, there has been some uh, research about uh, ADHD and uh, mismatch negativity, however, results are still quite inconclusive and differ between different studies. Uh, so we used a mismatch negativity task in which there were standard tones and three types of deviant or novel tones. So they could differ in frequency, in duration, or in frequency and duration and participants were 9 to 12 years old, and during the task they heard all types of uh, auditory tones. They were uh, looking at a movie, it was with nature, uh, nature clips, uh, which was obviously silent, and they were instructed to just uh, watch, and the tones just happened, they didn't have to do anything with them. So here are some first results. Uh, we have uh, in this current sample 27 participants and we hope to go up to 90. Um, so what you can see here, first of all, <laughs> this is the result I'm happy about, um, which is that the typically developing children um, are uh, best at this mismatch negativity, so lower responses means more broad attention, so less negative values, uh, which we see in the highly creative group. However, as you can see here, for example, the uh, group that has attentional difficulties seems to be really good at sensory gating, so we don't really have an explanation for that yet. Um, however, the sample is quite small, we are still collecting data, and as you can see here, the sample is still, there are large individual differences, although only uh, this one was an outlier, but it did not significantly differ in the results. Then for P3A, um, we were most excited about the duration P3A, so this shows, uh, once again, the less positive values show uh, less sensory gating and more broad attention. That uh, the highly creative group and attentional difficulty group uh, did show some decreased sensory gating in comparison to the typically developing group, however, this was not uh, significant. Um, what's interesting to note here is that uh, the duration deviance, so the uh, stimuli that were different in duration, uh, this is also the measure that um, is always the one that's significant for the schizophrenia patients and the others are mostly not. 
uh, once again, large individual differences, just still a lot of work to be done. So what does this mean? Um, of course, uh, we are uh, really interested into looking into age differences, which are very common in especially mismatch negativity. Uh, we want to look into gender differences and uh, take intelligence into account as well, as it's also highly correlated with creativity measures. Um, but we were also thinking of one other thing, and I would uh, like to refer back to this picture. So, um, highly creative children are always uh, have a broader sensory filter. And um, in this study, the mismatch negativity and P3A were a different score. So the standardized response was subtracted from the deviant response. And um, you can imagine that if you already respond really high on a standard response and then go a bit lower for the deviant, and then here are, for example, the typically developing children that score here on the standard and have a different response on the deviant. This might be the same, but where they are isn't. So I'm really excited to look into this and I really hope that uh, that might explain something. So these are my supervisors and uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Do we have questions? No, it's a lot to take in early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I have a, uh, a question. Um, this, I, I, um, I know you're aware that Dasha Sabellini also does related work. Yes. And uh, if I recall correctly, she also looked at the P50 component. Did mm -hmm. you also consider this aspect? Yes, yes. We are actually also looking into P50 component. Um, I've uh, briefly uh, discussed this at, uh, at the conference that I've talked about uh, earlier. Um, when uh, I presented these results, we uh, had, I think, 12 participants in the sample, and then with three groups, of course, it's uh, really difficult to make conclusions. Um, although the results did show the, the similar pattern, so creative people seem to have uh, reduced sensory gating, it's, uh, also still wasn't significant, but I'll be taking this into account or will mm -hmm. research this further. Yes. So because considering different indicators and see which is most sensitive to this. Yes, we are trying aspects. to see, um, of course, so P50 means 50 milliseconds after stimulus presentation and then P3A that I've presented to you today is 300 milliseconds after stimulus presentation. So we are trying to look into uh, where this temporal difference uh, might be uh, in a creative sample. Mm -hmm. okay. This isn't really necessarily related to neuroscience, but I know that the treatment for ADHD is Ritalin. Mm -hmm. And all the people, all the kids I know who've taken Ritalin always say to me, it's really hard to be creative yeah. when you're on Ritalin. It's really good for getting an assignment done mm -hmm. if you're, say, doing science, but if you have to think for yourself, if you have to write something imaginative, it's not the drug to take. What does that, you know, on some level, this talk tells a story about ADHD kids having this enormous potential, but then it being dumbed down by the drug. <laughs> um, and that's a very good, good point, thank you. Um, and, and I've also heard this from anecdotal evidence uh, in my surroundings as well, that um, when you take these, these uh, for example, Ritalin, uh, it can really um, decrease your creativity, your, your flow of ideas becomes um, more subdued in a way. Um, and uh, of course, for certain tasks, this is, this is good. If you want to do a very standardized task in school or want to uh, learn words in a different language, this might uh, be really beneficial, which is obviously why we also, uh, why practitioners prescribe these drugs. Um, but for creativity, it seems to be, yeah, more negative. And that's why um, for children with attentional problems, they are viewed as um, negative or less and um, we luckily see a trend that uh, also these more positive types of uh, having more broad attention are, are coming to light and are encouraged in a way. More questions? Okay. Uh, 
thank you for your presentation and for your original approach to the program. <laughs> thank you. And uh, I'm, I'm curious if you intend to explore also individual differences in creativity in, uh, in, in children with attention problems and looking if there are commonalities within this type of children and normal children, in a sense, normal. Uh, <laughs> uh, if there are some differences related to creativity or is only related to <coughs> attentional difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's really interesting. Um, <laughs> let me think. So uh, right now we are really making the distinction between these groups. Uh, of course, as I've told you, and maybe you've also been thinking about this yourself, uh, since there is large overlap between children with attentional difficulties and highly creative children, you cannot really make the groups as I've had them now, so I'll be doing different analyses to uh, account for this, uh, which might make a difference in, in the results and we might see different, uh, yeah, different outcomes. Um, and the task, uh, as Matthias was also telling in his, his keynote, uh, we now have a task where the children are actually instructed to ignore um, the tones. Um, whereas maybe when you direct attention towards them, as in a selective attention task, which I'm also luckily <laughs> have included in the test battery, um, you might see something different. You might see this shift happening uh, for um, being open towards the tones and then when you have to respond to them, being more focused, uh, which is something that's been um, discussed in the literature a lot, but uh, kind of lacks empirical evidence. Um, so I'm trying to also account or to look into this as well. Thank you. Okay, I think um, Mariah will be available for further questions in the break. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. And our next speaker is Adolfo de Costa. He has a, ma a master's degree in cognitive psychology and is a first year PhD student in business and behavioral sciences at the University of GIT Pescara. Department of Neuroscience, Imaging, and Clinical Sciences, and his main research focuses on the study of memory, emotion, creative thinking, and how these cognitive functions change during the lifespan. Um, please go ahead. Good morning. Thanks uh, for this opportunity to share our uh, preliminary findings on uh, 10 cores of idea generation. Studies on uh, 10 cores of uh, divergent thinking have shown that uh, as time passes by, the number of ideas decrease uh, while the originality increases. And uh, this is known as a serial order effect. Past uh, studies associated this effect to the use of different strategies with the initial production driven by an experience of strategy leading to common responses and the following production driven by a semantic strategies with uh, conceptual combination and more original responses. From a, f a physiological point of view, activity in the alpha frequency band has been associated to the 10 course of idea generation. In fact, especially in highly creative individual, an initial increase in alpha activity is noticed, and uh, later a further increase in alpha activity and a strong uh, functional coupling between the frontal and the parietal areas, which seems to indicate an high prevalence of executive control function during uh, these phases. Moreover, a, a recent study by Kraus et al shows that the left hemisphere alpha activity increases as a function of the serial order effect, and this may reflect an increased access to episodic memory. Some studies uh, also use the uh, tax stimulation in the alpha frequency range to investigate if alpha oscillations play a functional causal role in uh, creativity. And uh, in particular, TAX, which means transcranial alternating current simulation, is a non-invasive uh, brain simulation technique that applies uh, oscillating electric currents uh, on the scalp to enhance cortical oscillations at the applied frequency. And uh, uh, some studies using the 10 Hz TAX simulation, the prefrontal cortex, have shown some uh, improvements in creativity. Therefore, alpha activity has been associated to creative performance in divergent thinking tasks, but its role for the generation of the serial order effect is still not clear. And uh, so, uh, our aim is to explore by means of tax the role of uh, alpha activity over the frontal and the parietal areas in relation to the generation of the serial order effect. 
Our main hypothesis is that the 10 Earth tax simulation, both in the prefrontal and in the parietal condition, compared to SHAM, which is a no simulation control condition, can improve idea generations, but uh, in different waves. In fact, um, the prefrontal simulation could improve the um, creativity, but in relation to the temporal dynamics of ideas generation. So uh, our first hypothesis is that uh, the prefrontal simulation could improve fluency, especially in the early stages of uh, ideas generation, where fluency is maximal according to the serial order effect. The second hypothesis is that uh, uh, prefrontal simulation could also improve originality, especially in later stages, where uh, uh, it uh, naturally reaches its maximum peak in according to the serial order effect. So the prefrontal simulation could increase the serial order effect thanks to an improved uh, top-down uh, control process and uh, improved access to episodic memory, which leads to more available information. On the other hand, for the parietal simulation, considering the more uh, widespread uh, trend in AGL activity, we hypothesize an overall increase in creative performance, especially in improving uh, originality constantly since the early stage. So uh, the parietal simulation could lead to a decrease of the serial order effect uh, due to an higher suppress of distracting information and uh, to increase the integration of multiple cognitive processes. To test uh, our hypothesis, uh, we selected a sample of 30 university students in a within subjects experimental design over three consecutive days, in which we administered the 10 Hz tax during the administration of the alternative uses task. For the simulation, we set up uh, three different bilateral simulation conditions over three consecutive days, uh, one uh, on the prefrontal cortex, specifically on uh, F3 and F4, one on the parietal cortex on uh, P3 and uh, P4, and a shaman, no control simulation condition on the same location. Regarding each uh, AUT trial procedure, it was composed by a fixation cross, then uh, the stimulus was uh, presented on the screen for a maximum of uh, 30 seconds, and whenever the subjects had uh, generated an idea, he uh, or she had to press the space bar to go into the vocalization phase and expose it aloud. At uh, the end of this idea, he, had, uh, he or she had to press again the bar to go into the thinking phase until he had a new idea and so on. And uh, uh, each subject had uh, three minutes for each trial. The, each idea was recorded and uh, analy analyzed in a later phase. Regarding the AUT design, in all three sessions, it was composed by an instruction and a training phase, then by a pre-simulation phase as a um, baseline with the representation of three trials, and then uh, uh, the simulation was delivered, and uh, after four minutes break, uh, in online simulation paradigm, uh, were presented uh, three uh, blocks of uh, three trials each. After that, the simulation ended, and uh, in order to evaluate possible uh, post-simulation effects, uh, uh, there was another uh, block of three trials. The total duration was 15 eight minutes. In order to consider the serial order effect, uh, all the subjects' production were divided on the basis of their generation times in uh, three time phases, the first minute, the second minute, and the third one. And uh, uh, for each minute, the total fluency and the originality means were calculated for all subjects. Uh, moreover, to score originality, two expert raters relied on the method by Sylvie et al. Regarding the results, a mixed models analysis uh, was uh, adopted. And uh, first of all, there is a, uh, a typical serial order effect on fluency, which decreases with the passing of time, since the second and the third minutes are significantly different compared to the first one. Also for the originality, uh, there is a typical uh, serial order effect. Uh, in fact, originality score uh, increase uh, as time passes by, since the second and the, the third minutes are uh, significantly different uh, from the first one. Uh, moreover, we found uh, uh, an effect on the interaction between the fluency and the simulation condition. In fact, uh, uh, only the prefrontal simulation condition compared to SHAM uh, increased the, the total fluency, whereas there are no effects for the parietal simulation condition. In relation to fluency, we also observe uh, a true interaction between the simulation condition, the phase of simulation, and minutes. In fact, there is an effect only in the prefrontal uh, condition compared to SHAM especially in the first minutes where uh, fluency is maximal, and uh, uh, this effect is also specific to the simulation and post-simulation phases. 
Finally, also in uh, the originality, we found a three-way interaction between the simulation condition, the phase of simulation, and minutes. In fact, um, there is an effect uh, only in the prefrontal condition. Uh, this effect um, uh, there is especially in the third minutes, and uh, uh, especially in the simulation phases, where uh, we can also observe the typical uh, scatter trend associated to the originality. To sum up, our results show uh, uh, a widespread presence of uh, the typical zero order effect, and only the prefrontal and not the parietal one uh, simulation has an effect on the divergent thinking. This uh, improved effect is not stable during the time course of idea generation, since it is observed especially uh, in those phases where normally the performance is already higher in relation to the typical zero order effect. And uh, uh, so uh, the prefrontal simulation increased fluency, but especially in the first minutes, and uh, increased also originality, but especially in the third minutes. And this confirms our two uh, first hypotheses, whereas there are no effects on the parietal simulation condition. Uh, this study offers uh, several uh, interesting developments, such as uh, the possibility of considering individual differences in terms of uh, executive functional abilities and in terms of creative personalities, and uh, moreover to exclude the possibility that uh, the tax or the, sim the simulation in general could affect the investigated process, we intend to replicate this study but using a 40 Hz tax simulation. In conclusion, on the basis of uh, these uh, results, it can be hypothesized the presence of a causal link between uh, the prefrontal cortex activity and increasing in uh, creative performance in uh, AUT, when uh, um, the temporal dynamics of uh, idea generation are considered. So the present study, in underlining the fundamental role of the prefrontal area in divergent thinking, an area which is implicated in executive control, memory function, inhibition, ability, and so on, supports the controlled attention theory of creative cognition, which considers divergent thinking to be a top-down process that involves different executive processes. Thanks for the attention. Thank you very much for these exciting findings. Do we have questions or comments? <coughs> Maybe I <laughs> can start it up. So um, um, do, do you think this could be, the, the findings were not fully consistent as, as you say over time, but could, do you think this could uh, in the long run develop into an intervention that could be uh, generally applied or more to, to people with sp specific needs, maybe? On the simulation, uh, after... Uh, yeah. Uh, I think um, this effect um, could be present also after simulation. In fact, uh, during the post-simulation, there is a, a um, more presence of the, um, an, an increasing effect on fluency, which uh, increases after the simulation. So it's a mechanism uh, that uh, it's difficult to start, but uh, whenever, uh, um, when it is activated, uh, it continues on the time. Okay. Yeah. Do we have further questions? Just, uh, comment and reply to your question in a sense. Uh, we were looking for time dynamics. So the fact that things change and facts change from the first to the third minute is good. That's what we were looking for. So the process is not just a static picture, but it changes over time. So it's important to see what is important in the first minute, what is important in the third minute, and the effects will change. So that, that's what we were looking for. So, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It can also be helpful to, to clarify cognitive models related to, to, to creative thinking, of course. And so we have a question over there. <coughs> well, it's more a curiosity because maybe for all of you is given for granted, but <laughs> it's not really a question. What kind of stimuli you are talking about? It's, as, it's an electrical current, a Foo Fighters song. What, 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 what kind of stimuli are we talking about? Yeah, it's an electric uh, current uh, on the scalp at, uh, at a specific frequency that uh, was uh, 10 Hz uh, associated to the alpha activity in the brain. <laughs> yeah, it's an alternate current. Non uh, direct current. Yeah, it's a uh, methodic of the TSC, uh, the tax. 
So the alter uh, was an alternating current. Now we have one mobile device here, so you can see how it works. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> it's very easy to apply. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but next one should be more creative. <laughs> it's just a, a really quick comment. So I'm assuming it sort of it um, exaggerates or, or or enhances the the creative ideation generation if you're already doing it, right? So it's in the after the first minute. Am I right? Um, so can, can it work if you're not already engaged in something creative to actually induce the creative ideation? Yeah, it's uh, basically it's already engaged. It's already higher, the performance. But uh, uh, the simulation uh, improved, uh, especially these phases where the, uh, uh, where the performance is already higher normally, basically. Right, so it just improves that incrementally. Yeah. But have, have you thought about maybe using the same sort of idea to actually stimulate it, even if you're not already engaged in it? Would it work? Uh, yes, I think. Um, I don't know. Actually. That's probably up to future research, right? <laughs> so thank you very much again. Thank you. And we are coming to our third speaker, a local, local hero, Serena Mastria, uh, is currently a research fellow at the Department of Electro Electrical, Electronic, and Information Engineering at. Ju can you pronounce it for me? University of Bologna. No, it's uh, Marconi Institute of Creativity. Uh, just the first name is so difficult. <laughs> Guglielmo, that's it. Guglielmo Marconi, uh, and her recent research activities focus on the processes and the me mechanisms underlining the relationship between emotion and cognition, and particularly uh, with regard to the brain's response associated to the generation of novel ideas in creative uh, cognition. Now she will talk about switching categories. Please, the stage is yours. Thank you, Matthias. Presentation. I'm going to talk about the neural correlates of ideation flexibility. Okay, closer. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about the neural correlate of. Uh, Thank you. Okay, this works. I'm going to talk about the uh, neural correlates of uh, ideation flexibility uh, in creativity. As already uh, was well described by Matthias, uh, mm, the most... Mm. Nothing more. Okay. The most consistent evidence in the neuroscientific uh, research is that uh, a specific neural oscillation, the alpha frequency band over frontal and parietal regions, um, especially of the right hemisphere, is uh, um, uh, sensitive to different creativity tasks involving divergent thinking. In particular, uh, in the alpha power is higher uh, when individuals create um, ideas with high originality. Um, sorry. This study, uh, this EEG study, uh, mainly focused on the uh, originality dimension of uh, divergent thinking, of course, because it is the um, it is uh, strongest related to creativity. Uh, but the creative performance can be uh, measured in different ways. And uh, uh, recent studies have stressed the importance of uh, considering the flexibility dimension of uh, creativity. So. Fle technically, flexibility can be um, described, quantified, as the number of conceptual categories uh, in an um, individual's ideation, and uh, can be measured uh, as the uh, category switch, so when ideation moves from uh, one category to another and category switch, uh, so uh, a category stay, when ideation stay into the same category. Uh, it's important to focus on flexibility uh, because as ideation proceeds in divergent thinking, ideas tend to, be, to become more original and it is more probably, uh, it's most likely to switch to new conceptual category, okay? Um, our question is uh, how our brains works uh, during uh, ideational flexible um, 
a processing. So um, the main uh, aim of our study was to explore the neural correlates of additional flexibility during idea production. And we tried to answer to two specific research questions. The first research question was, are half activity pattern different when switching to a different category than staying to the same category? We may expect that something more, something different happened during switching categories as mm, the generation of high original ideas is, uh, uh, seems to be based to switching category. And considering the importance of the involvement of uh, frontal and parietal areas in uh, generating high original ideas, uh, our second research question was, what is the role of parietal and frontal areas during switching category? Okay. I'm going to mm, describe the experimental design very quickly. We involved uh, a total of 20 students from the University of Bologna and asked them to perform an alternative uses test. Um, Participants were asked to sequentially produce four different alternative use for everyday objects in four fixed time generation period. Okay, so after the visualization of the stimulus for a maximum time of three seconds, participants start to think about alternative use for this object for a maximum time of uh, 15 seconds. After this timing, uh, uh, when they were ready to produce the response, they uh, press the button and vocalize their response. And this was repeated four times, okay, in four different uh, idea generation period. After this idea generation phase, we asked to participants to evaluate the ideas, but in this case we focus on the idea generation phase. Um, in order to uh, explore the different involvement of uh, brain region in uh, flexibility, we aggregate uh, sensors creating um, six different uh, uh, sensor positions. Okay? The anterior frontal, the frontal, frontocentral, central parietal, parieto temporal, and parieto occipital areas. Um, Following previous studies, we analyzed the alpha um, uh, band in terms of changes in task-related power. This means that alpha power during the generation phase was subtracted to the alpha power during a reference period, so when they were in resting state. Um, okay, what about the results? Uh, I want to start to show you the topography of the alpha power, so the scalp map during uh, category stay and category switch. Here, the mm, red color means that alpha power increase, so alpha synchronization, okay? Um, the blue color means that alpha power decrease, so alpha desynchronization. And uh, we found that overall it was an, an higher alpha power over frontal and parietal areas as compared to parieto occipital areas, okay? Um, here you can see the alpha activity as a function of uh, the six different uh, positions that uh, I mentioned to you before. Uh, here to the, in the vertical axis you can see the changes in alpha task related power. So um, positive values means uh, increase in alpha power and negative values means decrease in alpha power. And we found that uh, during the category stay condition, uh, there was a an higher alpha power over parietal regions as compared to the occipital regions. Something different happened during switching category, something more probably. Um, during switching category, we found a different involvement of the hemisphere as a function of position. Specifically, um, the alpha power of the right hemisphere, so see the green line, was higher over parietal regions, whereas the alpha power of the left hemisphere, see the blue line, was higher over frontal areas. Okay? Um, in order to explore in more detail uh, this uh, uh, differential effect of the hemisphere as a function of position of the alpha activity, uh, we calculated a laterality score as the difference uh, in the uh, mean um, alpha activity of the right hemisphere minus left hemisphere. So um, the laterality scores was uh, uh, positive when alpha activity was uh, right lateralized and uh, negative when uh, uh, alpha power was left lateralized. So we found that uh, frontal and parietal area were statistically different from each other, okay? 
uh, to get back to our specific research questions, our first question was, are alpha activity patterns different when switching uh, to a different category than staying to the same category? Our answer is yes, because uh, we found a differential involvement of the hemispheric uh, um, effect, and the different hemispheric effect as a function of position from frontal to parietal region during category switch, as compared to the category stay, in which we found just an involvement of uh, the parietal region, okay, on, during the modulation of the alpha activity. And uh, um, our second research question was, uh, what are the role of parietal and frontal area during switching category? We found that uh, alpha power synchronized over parietal regions, and uh, these findings uh, seems to be totally in line with uh, a series of uh, uh, findings showing uh, that there is uh, this uh, modulation reflects an uh, internally uh, 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 focused attention okay, during idea, uh, idea generation. And uh, moreover, we found that uh, alpha power was, uh, um, was uh, higher over the frontal areas, and this could reflect a top-down executive control over parietal regions that help individual, maybe help individual to stop generating ideas in one category and switch to another category. This result seems to be in line with a series of uh, previous findings showing that the prefrontal context uh, seems to be engaged during uh, the uh, creation of uh, new association from stored uh, knowledge. Okay, uh, this is interesting. This is the first evidence uh, uh, of the neural correlate of flexibility, but I started to think about uh, uh, future directions. Uh, First of all, uh, I think it's important, uh, it can be interesting to uh, investigate the role of individual differences uh, in flexibility and its neural correlate. What does it mean? Uh, that people can have different strategies uh, in the use of the category, okay? Uh, some people can run into the same category for many production and other can jump from one category to another to at each production. So it's important to investigate this difference, okay, and its neural correlate. Um, we ask in this case participants just to generate ideas, so we leave free participants to generate ideas, but it can be interesting to um, ask at each trial in to switch or to stay so uh, manipulate the switching category. Uh, so in this case, uh, it can be interesting to explore the difference between spontaneous flexibility and adapti adaptive flexibility. Um, another thing is that uh, um, we asked uh, an expert rater to judge uh, to score the flexibility uh, score, but uh, we know that there are differences in the strategies, uh, but also in the concept in the uh, in the concept of the category. So it can be interesting uh, or useful to ask participants after each idea production in which category this idea dropped. So ask them, okay? Um, and um, moreover. Uh, we ask participants to generate alternative use for common object, but uh, it can be very interesting to use the instruction be creative, okay, uh, following previous uh, findings. Grazie. Thank you. Very exciting findings and great to see so much convergence in this field. So we have question. It's a really deep question. Um, <laughs> Uh, th did you see an increase in alpha uh, uh, leads to increased inhibition in the frontal areas? Is that right? Increased inhibition. I don't know if uh, we can, yes. I don't know if we can call inhibition mm. uh, because uh, we found that uh, there is an involvement of the frontal areas, uh, especially of the left hemisphere, during switching. I don't know if I think uh, we need more exploration okay. to. Uh, investigate if it's uh, an inhibition process to the base. Right, okay. but you definitely saw an increase in the amplitudes yes, or whatever. Yes, of okay. course, right, yes, right, increase right. in both cases, parietal and frontal right, areas. Right, right. Yes. And so you're saying that in the le when it's in the frontal area, that's kind of because it's, it's trying to help the switching of the exactly. parietal. This okay. is my interpretation, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Okay, I guess it could be followed up with, with connectivity analysis as well to clarify maybe this question whether uh, frontal and parietal regions uh, couple yeah. in this process. Yeah. Do you have further questions? <clears throat> okay. 
So I, I think this is this is really an exciting finding, but because it it helps to clarify why we see so much alpha activity during creative uh, uh, cognition. One process could be shifting of, of, uh, of categories. Would also be exciting maybe to look at closer what categories uh, you used. As you mentioned, maybe some of them are more visual and require more uh, internal attention uh, compared to other more conceptual ones. Did you check this maybe? Uh, yes, I, we can check, uh, but I, we didn't uh, analyze these uh, responses in terms of uh, uh, content, but it can be really interesting. Yes, mm -hmm. of course, I'm going to sign. I find this fascinating for helping business pick management because of the flexibility component, both adaptive or the other, that you might be able to create some exam test that would help identify facilitators in different business aspects of innovation that have the flexibility to change subjects among all of the different domains getting the product through. So I, I think it's very, very helpful if you could help us create testing that would identify the same thing. I agree. Thanks for your comment. Yeah. Just a quick question. Was the, after category switch, was, did you check if was, this was a particularly creative idea or did it make sense to switch category? No. Uh, for the Mm, no, because for the scoring of the for the mm, flexibility, uh, we just uh, consider the couple of ideas and uh, just uh, mm, check if there was uh, a switch. Okay, so okay. it's completely uh, different from the score of originality, but we also analyze the data in a different uh, work uh, uh, regarding originality of the ideas. Mm -hmm. okay. So this could be done. Great. Yeah, I can show you. So I think we, we are wrapping up this session. Thank you very much to the speakers and to the audience for the lively discussion.